Good morning, everyone. Welcome to part six of this lecture series on the law on obligation and contracts. In this portion, we are going to finish our discussion on the different kinds of obligation. So let me share my screen with you. Okay, we go to chapter three. Different kinds of obligation, section 5, divisible and indivisible obligation. We start with Article 1223. The divisibility or indivisibility of the things that are the object of obligations in which there is only one debtor and only one creditor does not alter or modify the provisions of Chapter 2 of this title. So under Article 1223, you are confronted with two kinds of obligation according to fulfillment. If the object or the obligation is capable of partial fulfillment, then you call this as a divisible obligation. On the other hand, an indivisible obligation is where the prestation is not capable of partial fulfillment. Now, we also have the kinds of division qualitative division, quantitative division, and ideal or intellectual division. When we say qualitative division, this means that the partial, the partial performance pertains to the quality and not on the number or quantity of the things which are the object of the obligation. On the other hand, when you say quantitative division, you refer to the number rather than on quality. Then third, ideal or intellectual division is where uh, there exists only in the minds of the parties or in accordance with the agreement of the parties. You also have legal indivisibility or partial performance depending on specific provisions of law or which the law declared as indiv indivisible in nature. Okay, And then you have conventional indivisibility which means that the, the performance is the, the impartial or the performance by the parties is, has been agreed by the parties, no? which makes it as indivisible. Okay. Now we go to Article 2 of 24. A joint indivisible obligation gives rise to indemnity for damages from the time any one of the debtors does not comply with his undertaking. The debtors who may have been ready to fulfill their promises shall not contribute to the indemnity beyond the corresponding portion of the price of the thing or of the value of the service in which the obligation consists. Under Article 1224 class, if any one of the debtors does not comply with his undertaking, in a joint divisible or joint indivisible obligation, then it is converted into one for damages. What's an example of a joint indivisible obligation? Class, for instance, uh, a person has ordered for the assembly of an invention, for example, a flying car. No? And then there are many makers which will be involved in the making of this high technology car. Now, if any one of the suppliers, for example, or the, the engineer or the engine maker does not comply with his own part of the undertaking, since the, the obligation is indivisible, meaning it is not capable of partial fulfillment, then the obligation is immediately converted into one for, for damages. That means that if one of the joint indivisible obligor or debtor does not comply with his own part of the undertaking, then the obligation is immediately converted into one for damages, meaning you have to pay for compensation. Okay. What are the effects of non-compliance? Number one, obligation is converted into one for, da into one for damages. And the number two, the creditor cannot ask for specific performance or rescission. Take note that only the debtor who fails to comply will be responsible for the damages, if any. Huh? Take note of that. 
that does not mean that the other debtors or joint indivisible debtors who are ready to perform their part of the prestation will be liable for damages. Only the guilty debtor will be liable to pay for damages. And take note, class, that the creditor cannot ask for specific performance because by nature, a joint indivisible obligation, when you say joint, each of the debtor has their own part of the undertaking or prestation and that it cannot be performed without the performance of all joint indivisible debtor. So the creditor may not compel the other innocent joint indivisible debtor to perform their own part of the prestation. And the creditor may also not ask for the cancellation or rescission of the contract. And the only remedy left of the creditor is to ask for damages from the guilty debtor. We go to Article 1225. For purposes of the preceding articles, obligations to give definite things and those which are not susceptible of partial performance shall be deemed to be indivisible. When the obligation has for its object the execution of a certain number of days of work, the accomplishment of work by metrical units or analogous things, which by their nature are susceptible of partial performance, it shall be divisible. However, even though the object or service may be physically divisible, an obligation is indivisible if so provided by law or intended by the parties. In obligations not to do, divisibility or indivisibility shall be determined by the character of the prestation in each particular case. So we, we have here in obligations not to do indivisible and divisible. If it is indivisible, it pertains to continuous fulfillment as to the given period. If it is divisible, it is forbear the forbearance of the obligor is not continuous in character. No, it is intermittent. Okay. Now we're done with divisible and indivisible. We go to the last kind of obligation, which is what? Section 6, obligations with a penal clause. Article 1226, in obligations with a penal clause, the penalties shall be, the, the penalty shall substitute the indemnity for damages and the payment of interest in each, in case of non-compliance, if there is no stipulation to the contrary. Nevertheless, damages shall be paid if the obligor refuses to pay the penalty or is, gu or, or is guilty of fraud in the fulfillment of the obligation. The penalty may be enforced only when it is demandable in accordance with the provisions of this code. You remember class, principal obligation and accessory obligation. A principal obligation no, is the one which the validity and existence does not depend upon another obligation. Whereas an accessory obligation, not the validity thereof and the existence depends upon another contract for its existence, okay? It is attached to the principal obligation. Now, a penal clause is an accessory obligation or an accessory undertaking attached to the principal obligation for the purpose of Number one, as an obligation, obligatory force, deterrent against breach or violation of the contract. And number two, as a substitute or substitute as a penalty for indemnity and payment of interest. Okay. Now we distinguish between penal clause and condition. Now, a penal clause constitutes with an, is constituted with an obligation whereas a condition does not constitute with an obligation. No, a penal clause is demandable and a condition is not demandable. Okay. Now, what are kinds of penal clause according to origin? It can be legal or conventional. When you say legal, it is provided by law. When you say conventional, it is by stipulation of the parties. As to purpose, it can be compensatory or punitive. Compensatory take the place of damages while punitive is a punishment for breach. As to demandability or effect, a subsidiary or alternative penal clause, the penalty can only be enforced while a joint cumulative is can be enforced with the principal plus the penalty. Okay, 
Under Article 1226, recovery of damages and interest can be stipulated by the parties. Now, you can also recover legal interest upon refusal to pay penalty by the debtor. And you can also recover damages when there is fraud in the performance of obligation. Now, we go to Article 1227. The debtor cannot exempt himself from the performance of the obligation by paying the penalty. Okay? Save in the case where this right has been expressly reserved for him. Neither can the creditor demand the fulfillment of the obligation and the satisfaction of the penalty at the same time, unless this right has been clearly granted him. However, if after the creditor has decided to require fulfillment of the obligation, the performance thereof should become impossible without his fault that the penalty may be enforced. Under 1227 class, a debtor cannot evade from payment of his principal obligation by choosing instead to pay the penalty stipulated, except when the debtor is expressly granted this right or the right to substitute the penalty for the principal obligation. Now, an obligation with, with a penal clause or penalty clause cannot be turned to facultative obligation unless there is an express stipulation by the parties in the agreement or contract. Now, Article 1227 class, the creditor cannot demand the stipulated fulfillment of the principal obligation and the penalty at the same time, except when the creditor was clearly given the right to, to enforce both the principal and the penalty, or when the creditor has demanded the fulfillment of the obligation but cannot be fulfilled due to the debtor's fault, where the creditor may demand for the penalty or the creditor's fault when he cannot claim the penalty or through a fortuitous event, in which case both the principal obligation and the penalty are extinguished. Okay. Article 1228, proof of actual damages suffered by the creditor is not necessary in order that the penalty may be demanded. Class, when you say obligation with the penal clause, that penal clause will specify for a specific amount to be paid by the obligor to the creditor in case that the principal obligation may no longer be performed. Now, in case that there is a breach, then the obligee or the creditor does not need to establish that there was actual damages that he incurred. The, the, the stipulation of the parties pertaining to the penal clause will always be demandable in case of breach or violation of the contract and proof of the actual damages is no longer necessary. We jump to Article 1229. The judge shall equitably reduce the penalty when the principal obligation has, be, has been partly or irregularly complied with by the debtor. Even if there has been no performance, the penalty may also be reduced by the courts if it is iniquitous or unconscionable. So 1229 class pertains to judicial reduction of penalty. Now this means that the court will temper the imposition or the amount of penalty to be paid to the creditor. You have principal obligation partly complied with by the debtor, no, but not in case of indivisible obligation because it is tantamount to non-compliance or in case that the principal obligation has been complied with, but not in accordance with the tenor of the agreement, or if the penalty is iniquitous or unconscionable, meaning it is skyrocketing. Now, if the penalty is too high to be imposed against the obligor, then the court may temper or may reduce the penalty. When you say iniquitous or unconscionable, it is revolting to the conscience or common sense. It is grossly disproportionate to the damages suffered. What about penalty which are not in enforceable? No? In case number one, it is impossible performance of the principal obligation due to fortuitous event because in this case, the obligation is extinguished. The creditor prevented the debtor from fulfilling the obligation and if the penalty is contrary to good morals or good customs. Fourth, if both parties are mutually guilty of breach of contract, then the penalty is also not enforceable. Breach of contract by creditor 
And then number six, none of the parties committed any willful or culpable violation of the agreement. We go to 12. So these are the instances class when even if there is a penal clause stipulated by the parties and there is a breach of contract still class. The obligor does not need or is not under any legal obligation to pay the penalty. Remember the enumeration one, two, three, four, five. Okay, Article 1230. The nullity of the penal clause does not carry with it that of the principal obligation. The nullity of the principal obligation carries with it that of the penal clause. So class, this is very straightforward. This only means that the extinguishment of the principal will carry with it the extinguishment of the accessory obligation. But the opposite is not true. We do not need to belabor this point. And so class, this ends my presentation. Okay. So next meeting, we're going to discuss about the different modes by which the obligation is extinguished. Thank you for listening and bye.